welcome to the very first Ask Jean Anything. Um, hello, Jean. Hi, Doug. Nice to see you. Um, we're sat here in the workshop, so if there's the occasional bang or rattle, that's just part of uh, life in a workshop. I've got a whole bunch of questions that have been sent in via our subscribers, our viewers, um, the people in our V8 Stealth Beetle community. And I'm going to pitch them at you, John. Are you ready? Yeah. We're going to have some fun with it, it, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're, we're good to go. We've got a cup of tea. So we, should we start in, yeah. um, sure. in the proper manner with a cup of tea? OK. One of the questions we get all the time is about roadworthiness or homologation, whether it's in South Africa for South African roads, as we are here, whether it's in the UK and certainly in the States. So what is, how do you stand with producing a vehicle, say either a full vehicle or someone builds their own, with getting it roadworthy in their own country or in their own state? There are so many options because there's so many countries. So for us to try and explain each country would, would take us hours. So I'm going to rather answer it this way. We have sent a vehicle to Germany and we sent it as a complete vehicle and it had to go through TUV and it sailed through that episode. And Germany had its own rules and regulations. So they, for instance, work on the principle that the engine had to be so many years old, as in it is, hasn't got the latest emission restrictions or specifications. When we sent a car to America, same thing. The engine emissions was a big thing. And we've got a car going to the UK. The same question was asked. The first question is emissions. If the vehicle is registered such that the emission falls into the correct category, which the LS will, because the LS is already homologated for X emissions. So if you're fitting the right vehicle, I mean the right engine, it shouldn't be a problem. But we also have a different scenario. So in the UK, the car gets registered as per the chassis number, but in the, in, in the UK, they talk about a, the car's identity number. And a, and a Beetle is identified by the body number, not the chassis number. In South Africa, the car is identified by the chassis number. So each country has got its own little rules and regulations. And I think the best thing is do a bit of research, find out what they like and what they don't like, contact us, and let's see how we could, what can we do from our side. Don't expect us to redesign the vehicle specifically to make it through your border post, because we're not going to do that. But we will definitely try our best to do what you need, whether it be on the paperwork side, the chassis number, where must it be stamped, blah, blah, blah. Does it need catalytic converters? We'll do that. We're not going to redesign the vehicle, but we will try our best to comply with the rules needed in your country. I think what you said there is very valuable, is that find an engineer or someone that's already brought in or registered a vehicle, something similar to like this, an individual vehicle, Precisely. because they would have gone through that process and, and they can maybe help you before Precisely. you start committing yeah. you know, quite a large check to actually yeah. build a car, because yeah. no one wants to deliver a car that you can't drive on yeah. the road. Andrew Hill also talks about that. In the, he's from the UK, and they talk about IVA testing, which is individual vehicle approval. I can actually answer you that, on that quickly. Um, in the UK, and I think there are other countries that have the same, if you produce less than X amount of cars, you feel, fall into a completely different category. So we have got a vehicle going to the UK, and we had to confirm that we, as 3L Engineering, don't produce 500 of these vehicles per year. We're never going to. Um, so then you fall into a completely different bracket, and it's got its own rules and regulations. Worth finding out about. Jeff Spencer sent in a few questions. Uh, his first one is, what aspect of the build design are you most proud of? And what makes you say, wow, when you walk into the workshop every morning? Well, that's an easy one. Um, I think we are, and I say we, because we have a whole team of guys that have worked at, on this. The chassis is the most exciting bit. We, we're about to build another three chassis. And every time we see one standing here, especially before the powder coating goes on, when you just see the raw aluminum there, 
or as the Americans say, aluminum. Um, it's just so beautiful. It's a, it, I see it as a, as a sculpture standing there, and a sculpture that can move quite fast if you do the right bits to it. And then as it stands there, we, we always say, that's the best part. And then we start putting suspension on. We go, actually, now it's looking even better. And then we put an engine in it. Oh, now it really looks nice. Then you put a so to say which one is the best, very difficult. But the chassis has always excited me every time I look at it. OK, so let's move on to a bit about the handling, because this is a, a car that's designed to go quite quick, certainly quicker than the original 40 horses. Joshua Kirkendall asks, one of the major issues with the bugs has been the steering. More specifically, they're cornering. They like to push it to the, they like to push to the outside or knife to the inside, mainly because of the weight of the weight distribution. Have you solved this and how? I, I have to smile a little bit um, because this is not a beetle. It's not a beetle. So I hear what a beetle used to do. We all know that you couldn't play hard with a beetle. But we must remember, and I think sometimes people keep thinking that we've taken a beetle and we've taken the back the engine and we've stuck it in here. That's not at all what we've done. We've built a new vehicle and disguised it by putting a beetle body on it. So to answer your question, there is no diving or whatever the old beetle used to do. You're sitting now with a modern day car with modern suspension. The beetle used to, as in some of them are still on the road, the, the beetle works on leaf springs in the front. Tiny little springs, leaf springs sitting like this, and these little guys moving along. Um, the anti-roll bar on it is so small that the first thing you can do, and if this guy, what is his name? Uh, Joshua. Joshua. Joshua, if you've still got your beetle, the first thing you can do is take that anti-roll bar out and put a, a, a much beefier anti-roll bar, and already the car will be transformed. But our car hasn't got the scenario. So the first thing is, with having taken the engine and put it in the middle, we've taken the weight and we've gone and put it in the center of the car, maybe a little bit slightly back. The, 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 characteristics and the performance and the road holding is it's 20 times different to an original Beetle. It's not a Beetle. That's interesting because a lot of comments when <clears throat> on the YouTube videos are, you know, well, you call it a Beetle, but actually it's not a Beetle. Yes. And, and you're proud of that fact. Yeah, I am you're not proud trying of to, <laughs> yeah. You're not trying to con anyone. No. Moving on. What about stability? Mm. How did you manage the weight distribution between the axles? Okay, so a little bit answered on the previous one. Having taken the engine and mid-mounted it transforms any vehicle. So if you can imagine driving a Porsche 911 where the engine sits off the back. Iconic vehicle. But we all know a 911, the nose is light. And this is modern German engineering because you have the disadvantage of all the weight being behind the rear axle. Then you can take the 911 Boxster S, where it has taken that same engine and put it in front of the rear axle. So it sits behind you, behind your back. Completely different car to drive. Both Porsche technology, both Porsche suspension, etc. But just having moved the engine to the middle of the car, the center of the car, transforms it. So we have done the same. Our engine's not at the back. And I sometimes think, because I've heard this question before from one or two people saying, how do you hang such a big engine off the back? The engine doesn't have a hang off the back. Go and watch the video again. Slow down if you have to, but have a good look. The engine is sitting here in the middle of the car. So how do you solve the weight distribution? We have solved it by putting the engine in the middle of the car. Late Esther Quinn asks, how long to make it 100% done? Now I'm assuming uh, he means how much, how long is it going to take to build a full car if we supply one, or if you buy the kit and the components, how long is it going to take for you to build it yourself? It's a fair question. Um, we're busy at the moment with six complete builds and one kit build. Um, needless to say, the kit does go a lot quicker because we're permanently buying components. To give an idea, um, 
let's use the steering column as an example, it's not worth us to produce one steering column, so we build 10 at a time. So when a person orders the component kit, we invariably have some of those components in stock. Whether it's for a complete build or not, we have a storeroom full of stuff. So if a person orders a component, generally three months, it's ready to ship. Um, if you order a complete car, that will completely vary by the amount of cars that are in production. So if you order it January, and we're busy with one bolt, then obviously it's going to take a lot less than we've got six cars in bolt. And as I said, we at the moment have six cars in bolt. So realistically, at this point in time, it's going to take us a minimum of a year before your car leaves the workshop, and probably more realistically, a year and a half. But it's worth waiting for. Absolutely. Um, we, we know what we're busy building, and we know how much time is involved and how much finesse is involved, it does take time. John, that is all I've got. That's our first Ask John Anything. I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, if you've got any other questions, you can always leave them in the comments below. John, I'm going to say thanks so much. Thank you so much, Doug. I enjoyed that. That was Thank good. You. That was a lot of fun. Thank you.